For most of us who agree with Elon Musk's vision of colonizing Mars, these are the sort of images that come to mind. A massive fleet of ships making its way towards the red planet with thousands upon thousands of colonists on board together with all the equipment and supplies they'll require in order to build a city. And even Elon himself has said that the process of designing and building the Super Heavy together with the Starship, not to mention mass producing a thousand of them and getting them to Mars is going to be the most difficult part of the process. But whereas this is undoubtedly going to be very difficult, I tend to think that this is when our problems are just going to begin, let alone be over. And although images like this do tend to inspire me, one also has to remember that upon arriving on Mars, you're going to be faced with a whole new set of challenges, because Mars is the least hospitable place that the human race will have ever tried to colonize, more inhospitable than Antarctica or the top of the highest mountain peak on planet Earth by far. The atmosphere is practically non-existent by our standards, it's absurdly cold at least most of the time, and the pressures are so low as to be fatal within moments, and that's just the beginning of it. There's also high levels of radiation, although not as high as the media would have us believe, and on top of that, the soil is full of poisonous perchlorates. <laughs> Mars is more dangerous than any place on Earth, except perhaps in the middle of a live volcano. Just surviving in such a place would be an immense challenge, let alone making it livable. And although Mars is full of absolutely magnificent wonders, such as the Valles Marineris that you're looking at right now, how do we make this planet attractive? How do we make it bearable? I mean, as I said, survival is going to be an extreme challenge, but also the challenge of isolation, the fact that you have to stay limited to your habitation module, whatever that might be, pretty much the whole day, and then when you do emerge, it has to be locked inside your own personal habitation module. How do we make this sort of living tolerable? How do we make it attractive? In short, how do we make Mars into a real second home? Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. For those of you who've been watching this show for a while, you probably know that when it comes to Mars colonization, I'm not a big fan of subterranean living. I feel that human beings are diurnal, evolved on the surface in the daylight, and are simply well adjusted to that. And when we go to Mars, we're going to be experiencing some very harsh environments that we're not well adapted to. One third gravity, for example, which is going to be tough to do anything about, extremely cold temperatures, no atmosphere, or at least no atmosphere that we can breathe a lot of things that are going to have a substantial impact on our day-to-day -day living. And the last thing that we need is the fact that we're going to be continuously exposed to artificial light day in and day out just because we need to protect ourselves from radiation and, of course, the extremes of the Martian climate. 
I don't think subterranean living is the answer. Of course, there are those who believe that this is the best way. It's the most obvious way, of course. But I just think that it's going to impose even more restrictions and even more hardships on Martian colonists than need be imposed and creates an environment similar to what Bill Nye talks about, living in Antarctica and a hellhole that nobody would want to raise a family in. And, you know, I used to really like Bill Nye until he said that crap. And since, uh, you know, since I heard that sort of stuff and since I've had a chance to do a lot of thinking since I started this channel, I've talked a lot about the options of living on the surface. And tonight, I want to go more into depth because NASA has sponsored a lot of contests and a lot of very talented engineers have come up with some brilliant and very futuristic ideas on how Martian colonists could live on the surface, protected from radiation, and yet having a beautiful view of the alien landscape, which we are so attracted to, places like Olympus Mons and the Vallis Marineris or wherever we choose to establish our city, that's the sort of living that I think that is going to be attractive to those who want to go to Mars. And I would really like to see that happen. And I want to show you tonight just how easily something like this could be accomplished. At least easy in terms of comparing it to digging massive caves, artificial caves for us to live in. So we're going to delve into that and see how Martian colonists can live on the surface and live well. We're going to go into that right now. Way back in 2015, NASA began the 3D printed habitat competition with the objective of using Martian materials to build habitats for explorers and astronauts on Mars. The challenge was broken into three phases. Phase one was the design competition where teams submitted their architectural renderings. Phase two was the structural member competition which focused on material technologies. And then finally phase three was the on-site habitat competition which tested the team's ability to advance technology to autonomously construct a habitat. And it culminated in a head-to-head -head competition in April of 2019, and by the way, it had a $2 million prize purse. Now I'm going to cover a few of the maybe less well-known members of this competition who really did some amazing stuff, and the first of these is a truly innovative company that brought from Earth, and there's a list of them there, including airlocks and windows, that sort of thing, things that cannot be made out of Martian regolith, but that's what I like, what you just saw there, the windows, the view, the natural lighting. And I like this too, the robot can isolate itself from the outside environment and dust storms, whatever, and keep going on printing structures. So when the astronauts do arrive, they're going to have their honeycomb habitats waiting for them regardless of what the environment was like before. Now the pressurized robot can also serve as an emergency habitat print, includes a central communal area for exercise or gathering, that sort of thing, plus an egress point for the Martian rover and for your spacesuit so you don't have to bring perchlorate laden soil into the structure. HGPE beams and stairs lead up to the mezzanine level, which provides a magnificent window for unparalleled panoramic views of the Martian landscape, plus above, so it serves everything that the crew needs, plus a laboratory section. And this is my favorite part, not only storage for equipment, including hopefully electron microscopes to study Martian life, a middle desk, all of these things created ahead of time, plus an airlock leading to the Martian rover from the laboratory section so you can get easy access to additional samples. And there you have it a modular system for living on the Martian surface from Zophorus. Quite a creation. 
Now, Zophris has since added a lattice work structure to the walls, adding more additional natural light to the structure and additional windows for the crew to look out of. But each window has a panel that can be slid shut so when the sun is shining directly onto it, it provides radiation protection if needed. If you like lattice work structures, the design from Con Yates definitely fits the bill. The concept features a 5 axis print arm that extends from the top of the core to print the shell using materials gathered from Mars, and then at the same time, secondary printing nozzles print a shell using high density polyethylene thermoplastic. Not a whole lot different from the other design, except it's one large structure, and then a portion of it does have an equipment hatch that allows it for connection to future habitats, but this is not a honeycomb. It's a single structure designed to contain a group of people surviving and living in style on Mars. As the shell reaches a certain height, additional structural strength is added through floor plates, which deploys from the manufacturing core. And then additional slab layers are created for each floor level desired, and daylight enters through that lattice work that you've been looking at. By means of having just the high density polyethylene layer as the skin and reducing portions of the central concrete in the exterior shell. So when it's completed, the pre-manufactured core contains all of the plumbing and the ventilation and the life support systems required, while the rest of the structure is devoted to living, to laboratory work, and to communal gathering. I like the design for two reasons. One's pretty obvious, all of the light and the windows and the views out onto Mars. But secondly, I really like it because of the shape. The shape is designed to be resistant to Martian dust storms and wind. But also, I really like the exterior. I mean, look at this front yard. It looks like something on Earth, but it isn't. It's something on Mars, and it's something designed to make the environment live and comfortable and conducive to the human psyche. Here's another view of the internal structure, but one thing to keep in mind is that NASA wanted to be certain that just in case 3D printing cannot produce a completely airtight seal, especially around doors and airlocks, that there would be a 48-hour emergency supply of environmental support and oxygen. Each team had to make certain that they provided that to the astronauts in order to make emergency repairs to the structure should that be necessary on arrival. In many ways, the Khan Yates design is exactly the same as Zophris. It has a place for laboratories and habitation and an area for sleeping and just about everything else that Zophris has to offer, and yet, at the same time, it could not be more different. Personally, given the spaciousness of this design, and also just the sheer beauty of it, I have to admit, this is a design that I happen to prefer. Although, NASA did not feel the same, and this particular design won third place instead of second. Still, I think it's gorgeous. I mean, wouldn't you want to come home to something like this instead of a dark cave mouth or some sort of lava tube on a Martian evening? I sure as hell would. But here's the first place winner in the third phase of the contest in two different categories, the Martian X House. And given that it's located in three different spots in the Valles Marineris, as you can see here, as locations for its construction, that is a dead giveaway for perhaps my favorite of all of these designs. It starts with a reusable vehicle setting down on Mars and the construction elements separating. 
Once it sets down, out comes the automated 3D printers, and these guys have thought of everything. The atmospheric pressure from inside a structure on Mars presses out simply because the pressure is so low on the inside. So like a dam, this design keeps the atmosphere in and keeps the pressure equalized, combined with a latticework structure to provide additional support. Design uses Martian regolith and Martian basaltic fiber, plus the shape makes it especially radiation resistant, as the shape of it gives it a 30 degree angle for all the windows to the horizon where the atmosphere is the thickest, therefore providing the maximum amount of radiation protection for the windows and for the astronauts looking out. In addition, as you can see, the atmospheric systems, life support are all separate per level and connected by a spiral staircase on the outside that is isolated from the rest of the structure. In case there's any decompression or some sort of disaster, the rest of the structure is isolated from the problem. Frankly, I can see why this won first place because these guys thought of everything. There is so much redundancy built into this system, plus plants and the water supply, a huge water tower at the top, supplies for the colonists obviously, plus additional radiation protection, and each floor provides ample living and working space for a sizable population of Martian colonists and explorers. Safe egress points to a Martian rover are provided and then up on the second floor you have spacesuits and egress points for them as well without allowing perchlorate laden soil into the structure. A lot of thought put into this. A massive window on the third floor providing beautiful views and areas to relax and enjoy oneself, which is important too, isn't it? And on the fourth floor you get even more of that. Recreation, workout areas, bedrooms, more viewing areas to look out at the Martian landscape. It's just a perfect design, or as close to perfect as I think you could manage. Construction is unbelievably thorough, including regolith concrete, continuous basalt fiber, expandable polyethylene foam, and HDPE. It's unreal the amount of layers of security and thoroughness that have been put into this construction. Even around the windows, there are four layers of insulation from the outside. And in case you want to have a more in-depth look at this, here's the foundation made out of Martian basalt and then the HDPE provided with additional Martian basalt and more Martian regolith and more basalt reinforcement. You get the idea. This is a solid construction designed to isolate the inhabitants from the rigors of the Martian environment. And here's the construction process day by day. It takes advantage of everything that we know about Mars, especially the design. The Curiosity rover determined that the closer it got to a cliff, the more that the radiation levels dropped off. Therefore, this design will provide the same kind of protection from radiation and from the rigors of Mars to those who live inside of it. It is an astonishing design and obvious as to why this one. When it comes to engineering innovation on Mars, I have barely scratched the surface. There are so many magnificent designs that all have their unique and amazing advantages and aesthetic beauty associated with them, to which some people have actually criticized these things as being too luxurious, too expensive, unnecessary, not really in keeping with the whole notion of surviving in a harsh environment, to which I say, who gives a damn? On a planet where death is going to be an all too present and common threat and every day is going to be a harsh and very difficult 
struggle for survival. I argue that these are the kinds of habitations that we should be living in. And the aesthetically and style-oriented Elon Musk, I think, would agree with me completely. This is our future on Mars. Be so excited, I think I'll throw in a merch plug here at the end. Look to the bottom right corner for some silhouettes of some very familiar looking ships getting ready to land on Mars in 2040, or sometime around that date. You know, when I've been thinking about the difference of living on the surface of Mars or living beneath the surface, something else had occurred to me. If our objective is to establish a self-sustaining Earth society, or rather a human society that can survive a global catastrophe, so long as it's not a huge meteor that utterly destroys the planet and rips it in two, why not just simply create a subterranean society that's highly secretive, highly isolated and from everybody else and survive that way? Why go to Mars at all? Personally, I think that the what makes the idea of surviving on Mars and a second human presence on Mars so compelling is the fact that we are going to be exploring and living in an alien environment, a beautiful alien environment. And that is with blue sunsets, for God's sake, amidst all of the other wonderful things that Mars has to offer, the spectacular landscapes that we've looked at, that the rovers have sent back, and that is only a tiny slice of really what lies in wait for us on this remarkable world, and I think that we should be exposed to it every single day, and these residences that I've talked about in this particular episode give us the opportunity to do just that and yet survive radiation, harsh climate, and everything else. And not only that, to have these residences built for us by the time we arrive. I mean, what could be more perfect? But then again, that's my opinion. And there are those who believe very solidly in subterranean living and that that's the way that we should go. Hard to say what's going to win out as far as I'm concerned, or maybe both will win out. Who knows? <laughs> it's really when it comes down to it, as long as we get to Mars, I suppose that's the main thing. By the way, you're again seeing names scroll across the screen, and that's because of reasons that I don't want to get into, but reasons that are associated with um, the event that are going on right now have had a very significant impact on my channel, and I put out an appeal to my supporters to help me out, to help me through these tough times and help this channel, this young business of mine survive. And that's exactly what they did. And so that's why I'm recognizing them here. If you folks want to be part of that, well, just go to the description. There are many different ways to support this channel and to make sure that I continue to bring you this content, including, of course, things like this merchandise that I keep wearing here. Um, um, this and you can get much better pictures of it in the uh, merch that lies just right uh, on my channel and easy access. But in any event, we'll stop talking about that, get back to Mars. So until we're actually on the surface of Mars and we're actually debating whether or not we should be living subsurface or living on the surface in the light or perhaps a bit of both, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.